Okay, there we go. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you've delivered, he will soon deliver you. Hey. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked yeah. where angels trod? Yeah, and when you kiss your little baby, then you've kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the That your baby boy is Lord of all creation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? And this sleeping child you're holding is the great I I was thinking as she was singing that song, Murray, did you know? Uh, she really did know because the angel told her so, right? Yeah, thank you, Della. Angel told her so, and, uh, and, and she pondered those things in her heart. She pondered them in her heart. That's what Mary did. Well, it's interesting, uh, you know, about, uh, well, let me say this now. When you leave, uh, the uh, church has got treats for you. You go out, you're going to have some treats. They'll be given to you here and be given to you at the back. I wanted to make that announcement. The deacons will be there taking care of this. And uh, they're the one that's, that did this, so the deacons. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, so I, I really prayed about this message, and, uh, and God put it together for me this week. And uh, so... It's a very simple subject, and uh, as you see it there on the screen, it is Jesus is. Well, I'm going to take the scripture and show you what Jesus is, because he, he is, he, he's, he's a lot, but I picked out some things here biblically that I think is 
relevant to our time in which we live, in the day which we now are living in. Now, the phrase Jesus is, it is really recorded in the Bible seven times. Jesus is. Seven times in the Bible. Now, the first place is John chapter 20, verse 31. It's recorded there. And the last place that it is, says Jesus is is Revelation chapter 19, verse number 10. That's those in the, in, in, at the beginning in John and then Revelation. Now, Jesus was, and I'm going to make this statement, Jesus was a liar, he was a lunatic, or he is the Lord. Right? He's either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. And so we're going to talk about that. Today we have the atheist. We have the homosexuals and lesbians, transgenders. They've all come out of the closet. We're the Christians. We're the Christians. I think most of them went in the closet. If anybody ought to be out of the closet, it'll be the Christians, right? Amen. We got the message. We've got the truth. And everybody else. I love to watch debates. You know, I, I really watch debates between atheists and Christians. And, and, and of course, they, there's been a lot of them. You know, Richard Dawkins, uh, he's a noted atheist, and I've listened to him, and I think, oh, dear God, boy, he's messed up bad. And uh, John... Uh, Let's see, what was John's name? He was uh, John Lenox. He's uh, also from Oxford University. He's a professor at Oxford University. And Richard Dawkins is a professor at Oxford University. And John Lennon is a Christian. He's a mathematician, but a, but a scientist. And I listen to their debates, and I like to listen to debates, especially, uh, you know, atheists. Now, and, and really, uh, they really put him under. They, He's got his, you see, you know what uh, Richard Dawkins and John, uh, uh, John Lennon's God, is, uh, Lord is God, and uh, Richard Dawkins' God is science. And that's where a lot of intellectual people's God is today, is science. Well, science can't get you to heaven. Now, science has improved our walk of life, and I, I appreciate the things, but science can't get you to heaven. No, the only one that can get you to heaven is Jesus Christ. No, no other, no other but Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at that. When you look at John chapter 20, verse number 31, and the first thing we're going to look at is Jesus is. Well, I gave you the introduction. Now we're going to look at the first point. The reason for the season. We see that everywhere today, don't we? I see signs in the yard. Jesus is the reason for the season. And that's everywhere. I, I understand that. And I believe that. But look at, look at John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe. And we have the Bible. We have the Old Testament. we got 39 books in the Old Testament. We've got 27 books in the New Testament. And it is written. It is written in the Old Testament. It is written in the New Testament. That's what it means here. It is written that you might believe. Amen. Aren't you glad you're a believer this morning? I'm glad I'm a believer. I'm glad I'm not just an intellectual believer. You see, there's a lot of intellectual believers. But that's not good enough. No, you've got to believe from your heart. You've got to believe from your heart. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I love the grammar there. I always look at the grammar in any passage of Scripture I'm looking at. Jesus is the Christ, not a Christ, the Christ. Definite article. The one and the only Christ. There is no other. Amen? Jesus is the Christ. He is the only Christ. He is the only Messiah. And then it says this. Not only that, look at the grammar in verse 31 too. The Son, the Son of the living God. <laughs> Did you know that Mormonism teaches that God had two sons? Are you familiar with that? Well, they say he does. Oh, no, I say he doesn't. He's the only begotten Son. One son, Jesus Christ. Lucifer was not God's son. Lucifer was a covered cherub. Lucifer was an angel that Almighty God created who turned out to be the devil, Satan, the evil one. So we've got Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, that believing now, of course that's a, not an intellectual belief, right? That believing, 
Where? In our hearts. That we believe in our hearts. You see, God don't, you, you know, we, we think with our mind. I'm grateful for the mind, and mine's a little old finite, limited mind. I understand that. There's far greater minds in the world than mine, far greater minds here than mine, but I'm glad that I can take my mind and analyze this thing. And I, I, I've got, you know, where did I come from? I've got to figure that out. Why am I here? I've got to figure that out. Where am I going? I've got to figure that out. So I figure that out in my mind. I'm either going to have to believe in evolution, I'm going to have to believe in the Big Bang Theory, or I'm going to believe in the great creator of God, and I choose to believe him. Amen? Amen. I choose to believe that God is the great creator of this enormous universe. I'm glad he created all the galaxies out there. I believe that he created the solar system, the nine planets that we're one of. I'm grateful that God did it, and he happens to be my heavenly father. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I believe that, right? In my heart. I moved it about 18 inches from here to here. I moved it from my head to my heart. Yes, I just had to answer those questions. So uh, I know where I'm going, right? Amen. Do you know where you're going? You say, I'm going home in a minute. I ain't talking about that home. <laughs> I mean, do you know where you're going when you die? Do you really know? He said, I had a man tell me one time, say, well, I don't know till I die. Oh, gracious. I wouldn't want to take a chance on that, would you? I know today. I know today. You say, how do you know? Because I have a witness. And the greatest, I believe this Bible. Ain't nobody believes it any better than I do, any more than I do. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 New Testament, 66 books together. Uh, it took 1,500 years to write it by 40 different authors. And I believe it's a miracle of all miracles. I believe the Bible. I'm a preacher of the Bible. But I'm going to tell you one thing. The greatest witness I have, not necessarily the Bible, it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit cleaned out a little spot in my spirit. And as a teenager, young teenager, God moved into my heart, and he's been there ever since. Amen. See, he's there. That's the greatest witness. I have a witness and I would say to Richard Dawkins, I would say to Stephen Hawkins and all the atheists, I'd say, yeah, well, you can, you can debate this, you can debate that, I, you can go run, give me this theory and that theory, you can talk about the Big Bang Theory, you can talk about that we came from stardust, all that. But I'm going to say, listen, i got a witness with me. Oh, what is that? I'm going to tell them about the Holy Spirit. They don't believe that. But I'm going to tell them anyway. I'd tell them anyway, wouldn't you? The greatest witness I have is the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> Wow, and he's something you can sense in your presence, in your body, right? I can't feel God like that, but I can feel God in my heart. See, the Son of God, and believing, believing in your heart, you might have or will have life through his name, physiological life. It didn't come, you know, from evolutional theory. We didn't, we didn't come from the monkeys. We didn't come from the apes. We came from a dirt that God took a handful of and molded it and breathed into the nostrils of man. And man became a living being, a living soul. That's where we came from. Amen. And by the way, whatever God gives is eternal, right? Breath. It's pneuma. Pneuma is the Greek Hebrew word. Pneuma. That's breath. That's life. It's invisible. And Adam began to move. And he created in him a spirit. And lest that spirit... Make a decision of where he's going to... So it's eternal life. Man, Adam was given eternal life. Now, he had to make a choice of where he's going to go, right? You have eternal life right now. You have it. You, you're going to change habitats someday. I'm going to change habitats someday. But I want to tell you, you've got eternal life. You're either going to live in heaven or you're going to live in hell. That's your choice. That's my choice. You know what? If I had it to make all over again, I'd still choose heaven, wouldn't you? Oh, it's the greatest decision I've ever made in my life. I've made a lot of wrong decisions, but I'll tell you one thing. That was the best one I ever made when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. So believing you might have life through his name. So I've got physiological life from God. I've got emotional life. I've got spiritual life in that I know God, and you do too. So the reason for the season Absolutely. Now, let me give you some things very quickly. Luke 2.11. For unto you is born this day 
in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, of course, a Savior, which is called Christ the Lord. That's the reason for the season, right? Amen. Right here. Right here's the reason. This day in, the day in the city of David, that event took place many years ago. And I've been to Bethlehem several times. I've been there for, uh, down, I told you before, I'll tell you again, you, you go to Bethlehem, if you go where Jesus was born, you go into this Greek Orthodox church. If you've been to uh, uh, Israel, you understand that. You go through this little, called the eye of the needle, and you crawl through that, get to the Greek Orthodox church, go down under the uh, altar of the Greek Orthodox church, and there's down there where they said Jesus was born. I've been right there where he was born, that place, they say. I don't know, but it, 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 regardless, he was born somewhere in Bethlehem. We know that. And he is a saint, the Savior, the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, uh, this was a little something I put together. The message of the Messiah came to who? The common men. Shepherds were the lowest of all people in, that, in the Roman Empire. And even the Jews thought they were very scum of the earth, common people. Aren't you glad the message of the Messiah came to the common people? Amen. That's what it came, it came to the common people. And these shepherds heard the angels, and they were praising God and said, there's going to be a baby born. It's going to be in Jerusalem. And God, the angelic host, revealed to the common man the, messes, the message of the Messiah. And, and I was a common man. Are you a common man? And when I use the word man, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not leaving you out, that's the gender to me, masculine and feminine. When, when we use the King James Version Bible, it always talks about man. But it also includes you women, too. It is human beings. So you were a hum, common person, and, he, and the message of the Messiah came to you, right? It came to me. Amen. He came to the common man. But he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. There's another one. I looked and found some others. And here's the message of the Messiah came to a spiritual man and a spiritual woman. And it happened to be in Jerusalem. And you get to Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 38. You go, when Jesus was born uh, and, and, and Mary and, and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple, who did he meet there? The message of the Messiah came to a spiritual man. You remember the man there? Okay. Do you remember the woman there? Okay, there's there, waiting on the Messiah, you're right. Simeon said, my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Now let thy servant depart, what? In peace. Amen. You see, the message came to a spiritual man and a spiritual woman there in Jerusalem. But it didn't stop there. There's another, and I want you to look at it. i put this one on the screen. The message of the Messiah came to the intellectual man. Oh, yeah. Now, we got the Magi, or the wise men from the east, from what we probably call Iraq today. They came all the way. Oh, they, these are very smart uh, people that study the stars, you know. Astronomers, I guess we would call them. Astronomers, intellectual men. Aren't you glad the message came to the common person? Aren't you glad it came to the spiritual person and the religious person? Aren't you glad it came to the intellectual person? We have intellectual people that are saved. There are intellectual people that are very smart, highly intelligent. I mean, we got a lot of them that are apologists today. These apologists can go on any college campus and debate atheists. We have a lot of highly intelligent, intellectual people. Amen. We got a lot of common people. We got a lot of religious people. And we've got a lot of intellectual people. But the message of the Messiah came to all of these. That'll about cover everybody, wouldn't it? The message came to all. All right. But some say, but I think it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter, match up with the Bible. You're wrong. If it doesn't match up with the Bible, whatever your philosophy is, whatever your belief system is, if it doesn't match up to the Bible, you are dead wrong. Amen. Amen. I believe that. In Romans 8, chapter 3, verse 4, look what it says. And let God be true and every man be a liar. Jesus is a liar. He's a lunatic or he's the Lord. He's one of those to you and to me. Now, the reformer, 
What is a reformer for? Light. The reformer for the religious man. Jesus come on the scene. See, he came in to Jerusalem at the age of 30 years old, and he had a lot to deal with, right? And he had to deal with religious people. And they were called Jews, called Judaizers. That was the religion of the, of the day. And Jesus, of course, being a Jew. And he said, verse number 17, he said, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law. He didn't come to do that, did he? Not to destroy, to annihilate the law. He didn't come to destroy the prophets, no. He said, I'm not come to destroy, but I've come to fulfill. I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to do that. I've not come to do away with the prophets. I've come to fulfill the prophets. He is the reformer of the religious man. Did they believe him? Did the Jews say, oh, glory to God, we got the Messiah here, right? He went to his own and his own received him not. They didn't accept him. Amen. But he came to reform the religious man. How, today, would you agree with this statement that I'm about to make? That probably one of the greatest deceiving things there is today is religion. Do you, do you believe that religion will get you to heaven? Absolutely not. Well, I'm religious. Well, the Satanists are religious. The cults are religious. Religious, religion will try to reach God. That's what it tries to do, get to God through works and good works and different things. That's, that's what religion is. What well, a difference between religion and salvation. Jesus comes to reform, fulfill the law. And, of course, they rejected him. Religion tries to reach God through good works. Salvation reaches down to man. So religion tries to reach up to God, but God reached down to man. That's salvation through his son. Incarnation, the total incarnation of the son of God. Blows our minds, don't it? How? That he could be conceived in the womb of a woman without the aid of the seed of the man. But that's God's business. <laughs> Hallelujah. I believe it, don't you? <laughs> Can I explain the virgin birth? No. <laughs> I can't explain a lot of things, but I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I do know one thing. The blood of a child is not determined by the father. I mean by the mother. I'm sorry. Excuse me. The blood of a child is not determined by the mother. It's determined who? By the father. And Joseph, had he conceived in the wound of Mary, and Jesus' blood would have been contaminated. Because you see, human blood is not sufficient enough to forgive us of our sins. Precious is the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all sin. Five quarts of blood in your body, and it runs through here 23 seconds. Every 23 seconds, this blood goes through the body. And it, and it brings oxygen and all precious things to feed every organ in the body. And it picks up the waste parts and, and deposits them through the bowels and through the breath, which is carbon dioxide, as I said. And that carbon dioxide that we're breathing right now goes outside into the leaves and trees and comes out as oxygen. I tell you, God knows what he's doing. Amen? God knows what he's doing. And deposits the toxins in our body. That's what the blood, our blood does. But the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin. Amen. We're saved today by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wow. Isn't that glorious? He come to reform the religious man. For verily, and the word verily means truly. For truly I say unto you. Now here it is. I'll tell you what, it, it pays us to listen to what Jesus has to say, right? Jesus is saying it. Verily, truly I say unto you. Until or until, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Until, until what? It all be fulfilled. Well, let me ask you this. Has it been? Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus completed it. Not one jot, not one tittle, passed away, Jesus fulfilled it. 
Hallelujah. He came to reform the religious man. Judaism was a religion, right? That was a religion. Still is. Still is. Still is. Well, I want to give you six major, very quickly, I want to give you six major religions of the world. It's interesting when I did a research on this to find out these six. There are more than that. But Hindus acknowledge multitudes of gods and goddesses. I said, you mean to tell me they got 33 million gods and goddesses? How in the world could you worship that? You believe that? That's Hinduism. That's what they believe. Are they going to heaven? I don't think God's in, in, the, in, in here, right? That's polytheistic religion. That's, that's Paulo. That's worship of many gods. 33 million gods and goddesses? Lord have mercy. I mean, it would take you a lifetime to pray to every one of them, wouldn't it? Could you ever, get, could you ever thank every one of them? Well, it would take you forever. I thank this God. I thank that God. I thank 33 million. Oh, bless their hearts. They need to be saved. They need to be born again. Buddhists say there is no deity. That's what they say. There's no deity. There's no God. Well, I believe there is. I believe there is. New Age followers believe they are God. There's a lot of them up in Asheville, ain't there, Scooter? There's a few of them up there. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure you have to run into them being the director of missions of Buncombe County. I'm, I mean, you know, but they're not only up there. They're here, too. They're New Age moved people everywhere. They believe they're God. They're everywhere. And so, you know, I don't believe they're God, do you? But they do. They really, the devil has got them blinded. And they believe they're God. Well, yeah. that's the third one. What's the fourth one? Muslims believe in a powerful but unknowable God. Allah, I don't know him, do you? I don't know Allah. But I know Jehovah. <laughs> I know Jehovah. That's, that, that Jehovah, if you, if you amplify that word Jehovah, it means underived existing one. He doesn't have any beginning. He doesn't have any ending. He turned the lights on, and he'll turn the lights off when this thing's out of order. Amen. He is Jehovah, the underived existing one. I know him. I don't know all I. I don't know him. Besides that, our God don't tell you to go out and kill all the Christians. Judaism believes in God. They're monotheistic. Well, you look at Muslims here. They're monotheistic. They worship one God. You, you look at Judah, Jews. Judah, they, they're monotheistic. That mono one God. They worship one God. So we got the Muslims that worship one God. We got the Jews that worship one God. However, the Jews don't worship Jesus, right? And I, neither, does, neither do the Muslims worship Jesus. Because if you say Jesus is Lord. Now this is, the, I got it, it's in the Quran. If you say Jesus is Lord, you know what they say? You'll burn in hell. Jesus is Lord. Amen. I had a friend of mine, first pastor, First Baptist Church in Spruce Pine, was preaching. He preaches on Facebook and everything. He got a letter from this real nice, highly cultured Muslim I don't know where he's from, some foreign, from the Middle East. And yet he disagreed with my pastor friend on about Jesus. But he was nice. He was real nice about it. And that's fine. I don't mind somebody disagreeing with me, you know. Uh, uh, if they disagree, that's fine. We'll, 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 we'll agree to disagree. But I don't believe in Allah. I believe in Jehovah. And, and, and I don't believe in Judaism. I don't just believe in God, I believe in Jesus. You see, the Judaism just believes in God. They don't believe in Jesus. So that's a problem, right? I know that God in, in the book of Romans, uh, you know, he will deal with Israel again. He will come back and uh, there's still seven years that he will deal with the Jewish nation. We all know that's in the future, that, that God will take care of that part. But uh, you've got to believe in Jesus. Christians believe in a God who is loving and approachable, right? Isn't it wonderful that we have this wonderful opportunity every day, and I'd like to say every morning, I hope you do it every morning, every morning when I get out of bed and I, I, I wash my face and get to sleep out and I get my, a cup of coffee, man, I got some of that caffeine in me, and I look right up and I tell the Lord I love him. Amen. Amen. I love my Lord. 
I love him. I love Jesus. And I love the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you, isn't it wonderful that you can approach him? I mean, you go just go. I, I know many times when my father was living, I could go over to my, my, my father's house. And, and, and just I didn't knock on the door. I just walked in. I don't know. You may knock. I didn't. I just walked in. This is my mom's out there. I just walked in. <laughs> and I didn't say, dear sir, that's all right. To, you know, I, I think it's good manners to use the word sir. I ain't against that. But when it was my dad, I didn't say sir. I said, dad, how you doing? I just walked right in the presence of God and approached my heavenly father. And I said, hey, dad, how you doing? Oh, glory to God. I don't know about you, but I want to tell you, God is real. And I want to tell you, glory, glory to God, you can sense him in your spirit. Amen. You can feel his presence. Isn't he a wonderful God? Isn't he a wonderful father? I can't help myself. You bear with me. I'm having a good time. Because I'm exalting and glorifying God. And God says, when you go to church, I want you to worship me. But I want he gives the criteria for worshiping him, right? In John chapter 4, he said, I'm looking for people who will worship me. In spirit and in truth. Amen. God is looking for you and me to worship him in your spirit. In here. That's in, that's in spirit. In spirit. In your spirit, you are to worship God. And every once in a while, it might be hallelujah, glory to God, smile. It could be some kind of resp response like that because, you see, if he's on the inside, I believe he'll glow on the outside every once in a while. Yeah. Amen. Isn't God good? God is good. And we glorify God. Wow. He's approachable. Personal. John 8, 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That word know means experiential. Experiential. Well, I don't know if you know this guy or not. You Bible readers and history. I'm a history buff. Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a... Uh, you know, he's a monk. He was Catholic. And uh, Catholicism, let me give you just a brief sketch, and I'm going to hurriedly along. Catholicism changed, I mean, became in existence through Con Constantine, I believe it was, the king of Rome. He was the Caesar. But he got saved, and he revolutionized. They used to, Nero and Domitian, they all killed the Christians, you know. But Constantine, he, he got saved and he revolutionized Christianity. And he became the Christian, the, 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 the church became a, a part of the state. And it was run by the state. And then it, Catholicism, and you go down through the popes and the popes and the popes and all that. And so it was Catholicism, and Martin Luther was a, a, a Catholic. And so really it was all by works. Everything was by works. And so he wrote that thesis, and you know, and I forget how many pages, how, how many it was, but he wrote a thesis and put it on the Pope's door, and boy, was he persecuted. And there was the great, what we call the Reformation. Y'all, if you've ever heard anything about history, there was a biblical history, or uh, yeah, biblical history. Then there was a Reformation that took place. Now, in that Reformation, you know, it was, uh, I see, what was the year? Is the 15th century. It was the 15th and 16th century that the Reformation took place. And then you, and, and what happened in the Reformation, they separated from the church of the Catholic Church. And uh, that's where we got the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and, uh, and the Lutherans, and all that. They all separated from the Catholic Church. And that was the Reformation. So he was a reform. So God is a reformer of the religious man, right? So God, no doubt, had saved Martin Luther and, uh, let's see, there was another, and Zingui, he was one, and uh, there's several of them at that time on the Reformation. And so what they did, they began to get saved. It was by grace, not by works. It's by grace. You can't work your way in. And so therefore, we've got all these denominations today in the Reformation, the 15th, 16th century come out. And of course, we Baptists never did come out of the Reformation. We were Anabaptists. We opposed infant baptism. And if you've ever read the Trail of Blood, and which I have, if you read the Trail of Blood, you will find that the Catholic Church murdered 2 billion Christians because they condemned infant baptism. So there's a lot went on in the 15th and 16th century. And it's all because of that. And so we 
Baptists are baptizers. That's what we are, baptizers. We get our name from John, John the Baptist. So we didn't come out of the Reformation. I don't know who we come out of. We come on, go on, the, on the boat from, from, and come over here with the pilgrims, and here we are today. Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect. We're a long way from it. But if I thought there's something better than Baptist, I'd join it, wouldn't you? Amen. Amen. Amen? I mean, I'm not a Baptist because my dad was a Baptist. I'm a Baptist because I believe in the theology of it. Amen. That's why I'm a Baptist. And I got friends that everyone, are they people saved in every denomination? Yes, they are. Amen. There's people saved in every denomination. Amen. Yeah. There's Catholics saved. There, so, so there's people saved everywhere. But I'm just dealing with history. I'm just telling you what, what history was and is. So he was a great reform, reformer. So was Jesus, right? He was a reformer of religion. All right, last of all, you still with me? Okay, as long as you win. The Redeemer for sinful man. That's what Jesus is, okay? Jesus is the reason for the season. Jesus is the reformer for religious men. And then Jesus is the Redeemer for sinful men. Now, that's you two ladies. Don't remember that. Everybody. Everybody. Now, you know what God wants back? You know what God wants back? You have something. I have something that God wants back. Now, you know what it is, don't you? He wants your what? Sure. You have something God wants back. He gave man a soul, or if you prefer spirit, whatever. I, I use, they're interchangeable sometimes. God gave man a soul, a spirit. He wants it back. But in order for him to get it back, he had to go through a process, right? Adam messed us up, ladies and gentlemen. Adam and Eve done us in, right? I mean, they messed us up big time. You say, I blame them. Well, I guess if you want to trace it back, that's who you blame. But then again, the Jews crucified Jesus. But what about me and you? Are we guilty? Amen. We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God, right? Amen. We've all sinned. We're all guilty before God. Who gave himself for us. Look at verse 14, Titus 2, 14. That, we, that he might redeem us. Re, <laughs> that means to purchase back, Right? When you redeem something, it's like going to a pawn shop. You take something to the pawn shop that gives you money for it, and you've got a certain length of time that you can go and redeem that object, right? Pay the man of the, uh, uh, back the money and a little uh, fee uh, that he makes money. Okay, Jesus said it, to redeem means I want back what I gave you. And he had to pay a price for it, correct? And he did. It said, who redeemed us from all iniquity and purified unto him a peculiar people, Zealous, zealous of good works. And I'm not against works, you know. We, we have works, but that's not sufficient to get us to heaven. Amen. you got to have works. I mean, you know, I can't understand Christians that don't have any fruit. If you don't, if you don't have any fruit, that tells me there's something wrong in your life. Right. you got to have fruit. Amen. And so, a peculiar people. Now, you look at that word peculiar. To pe peculiar to us today in our generation means odd, weird. So, boy, he's a peculiar person. You ever use that word? Meaning, boy, that's an oddball out there. This is an oddball. This is a weird person. Peculiar. We're strange. That person's strange. That's not what it means. It means possession. A possessed people. Not a weird, strange we're a person. It means a possessed people. God possesses us in that he lives in our spirit. This is his possession. The very moment that you pray that prayer, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I'm, I, I, I want you to save me. And, and John 10, uh, Romans 10, 9, If thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The very moment you say that, pray that prayer. And mean it from your heart. 
you get saved, right? <laughs> we, we were talking on the way in. Uh, uh, Stella and, and, and Scooter and I were talking on the way in about how simple it is to get saved. <laughs> My stars, all the thief on the cross said was what? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Is that a hard prayer to pray? No, but the thing of it is, now where does God look on the, in our heads? No, he looks in your heart. From that man's heart came a repentant heart. He took the ashes of a, blowed out, a burnt out life, <sighs> blowed it in the face of Jesus, had no works, he had nothing. But Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. Isn't that glorious? Hallelujah. I give glory to you, Jesus. You came to seek and to save those which are lost. Why am I saved? Well, I praise him this morning. I glorify him this morning for what he has done for us. Wow. Don't that make you praise the Lord than what he did? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He went to be with the Lord. He's with the Lord now. So it's all it takes. Believe if I will confess. Agree with God. Agree with what I'm telling you this morning. Jesus is the reason for the season. Jesus is the reformer of a religious man. Jesus is the redeemer of sinful men. You've got to believe this. You've got to believe it. Well, you know, in Acts chapter 24, 25, I don't have it on the screen, but Felix, Felix, Felix was a governor, and uh, Paul had witnessed to Felix in that chapter. And after presenting the gospel to Felix, you know what he said? You Bible readers, you know what he said. Almost. No, uh, yeah, yeah, almost I'll persuade you. No, no, it was Fe uh, Festus said that. Just, yeah. Felix said, I, when I have a more convenient season. Yeah, we get it right. I, I was wrong too. When I have a more convenient season. When I have a more convenient season. I'll accept it. I never found, found in the scripture where you had a convenient season. But that tells me there is a season. That tells me there is a time that God's Holy Spirit begins to knock at a person's heart. And I believe he invites them into the kingdom. I believe there's a time for that. I, ha I remember that time when God's Holy Spirit began to convict me of my sins and knocked at my heart's door. I remember it so vividly and I didn't miss it. I said, okay, Lord, I accept you by faith. I take you as my Lord and my Savior. I didn't miss it. He missed the opportunity. There are multitudes of people in hell right now that missed the opportunity to accept Christ because they were waiting for a more convenient season. I'm young. You might be here and say, I'm young. I got plenty of time. Day. No, no, today is the day of salvation. When the Holy Spirit knocks at your heart door, that's the time to get saved. All right, let me hurry a little on here. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man, Christ, is come to what? Seek means look for, right? I'm glad he found me, aren't you? <laughs> I'm glad he was seeking for me. I'm glad he found me. I'm glad he did. He found me right in the midst of my sinfulness and my wretchedness. He, and then he said, he saved me. You know what saved means, don't you? A lot of people say, we don't use that word no more. We're, we're, that's not politically correct. Who cares? Who cares whether it's politically correct or not? It's biblically correct. Amen. The Bible says saved means you've been rescued. You've been delivered. I'm rescued today. I'm a recipient of God's divine grace. I got my name written indelibly in the Lamb's book of life and I'm going to glory. Amen. <laughs> he saved me. He rescued me. Wow. I had to first of all realize that's what? You know why I offend this culture. I'm, I'm just an old-timey biblical preacher. And bless God, I'm proud of it. Amen. Dr. Crisfield, Adrian Rogers, R.G. Lee, all them old-time preachers, you know, that's the kind I like. I grew up under. I love those kind of preachers, man. And we got some good ones today. I understand that. We got some ain't nothing but more than entertainers and, and motivational speakers, too. We need men of God who preach the Word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Preach the Word. We don't need a theological essay on Sunday morning. We need the word of Almighty God Amen. preached to our people. Lost. And when you tell people they're lost today, they get offended at it. I'm not lost. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Well, I, I'm still a sinner. 
I'll tell you right up front, I'm still a sinner. Only difference is I'm a safe sinner right now. But I had to understand my lostness before I could be saved, right? And preachers, we got to get them lost before they can get saved. He's the Redeemer. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, praise God, that had nothing to do with it. we got millionaires and billionaires could buy a million dollars with salvation, but they can't get it that way. From your vain conversation, your vain lifestyle, your manner of life received by tradition from your fathers. You, and let me tell you, tradition is one of the worst things in the world. And a lot of times we, we pass on our religion to our children. Because I've had one to tell me when I was in Israel one time at the, down to Qumran Caves. I remember asking, this, we asked this gentleman, he, we asked him, I said, when did you get saved? He said, I've always been saved. Really? Always been saved? Yeah. My mother was a Christian. My dad was a Christian. They both, they conceived me into Christianity. And I am a Christian. I thought you had to be born again. Amen. That's contradicting Jesus Christ, isn't it? Amen. Doesn't it say you have to be born again? Yeah. You're not born a Christian, right? No, no. Okay, so tradition is a big problem in our culture. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without blemish and without spot. Pure. Only one that could die for us was Jesus Christ. Amen. No one else. Jesus is the reason for the season. Will you say amen to that? Amen. All right. Number two. The reform, Jesus is the reformer for the righteous man. Will you say amen to that? Amen. All right. Now the third one. We're, we're, we're closing here. Jesus is the redeemer for the sinful man. Will you say amen to that? Amen. amen. All right, we all agree, right? Amen. All right. I love this song. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, my blessed redeemer. Don't he deserve praise this morning? Amen. Christmas Eve. Tomorrow we celebrate his birthday. And I'm praising him right now. I had one goal in mind when I left my house. When I got off my knees this morning and I got to talk with God, I said, God, I got one goal in mind. I want to go to Hillcrest and worship you and praise you. I want to praise you in song and I want to praise you in sermon. I want to praise you this morning. Hallelujah. And I'm doing, I'm having a good time. I am praising my Lord. And I believe you are too. So you do it in here. You do it in here. You praise him in your spirit. And in truth, truth means we've got to be right with God. <laughs> there can't be no hypocrisy in it. No, we have to be right with God. You can't live in the world out there and come in God's house on Sunday and never repent of all those things and come in and worship God. You've got to live right. You've got to do it in truth. God knows the heart. And let me tell you, when God looks into my heart, he sees me. He's, he's, he confesses. Well, we have to pray every day. Do you pray every day? I would hope so. Daniel prayed three times a day. Amen. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Now, I'm bringing it from the then to the now. From the then to the now. Who do you say Jesus is? That's the question. Okay. Some say he's a liar. Luke 22, 70, are you the son of God? The Jews said he was a, son, he was a liar. You're, you're, not, you're not, you're Joseph's son. You're a liar. That's what they said. There's people today that say that. And, I, and some of them say, did you know his own family? When you look at Mark chapter 3, verse 21, and, uh, and then uh, Mark 3, 22, the Jews said he was a lunatic, Beelzebub. His own family came to when he was down there at Capernaum preaching. You can get it in Mark chapter 3. And when he was preaching, the multitude was there, and he was ministering to the multitude, and they were outside. He was casting out demons. He was healing the sick. And his family members, Mary and the brothers, he had some brothers, they came there, and, and the people said, your family is calling for you. And said, so they kept, they want to lay hold on you. Lay hold. Now, that means go over and grab him and pull him out of there because, and here's what they said, because he's beside himself. His own family his own brothers said he's beside himself. So they're saying he's a lunatic. He's crazy. Did you, have you ever read the scripture? Well, if you haven't, you know it now. Read it. 
said you beside yourself. And you translate that into English today, it means you're crazy. You're a lunatic. His own family said he was a lunatic. Now, that, now, now let me say this. Later on, later on, they agreed that he was the Messiah. They got right and got saved. They, they did. His brothers and all and sisters got saved. You're either a liar or a lunatic. Now, last of all, this is this. I want to ask you this question. Who do you say he is? I don't think there's a person in here who would say he's a liar. I don't think there's a person in here who say he's a lunatic. I think, and I hope all of us can say this, he is the Lord. If you can't, Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter said it real well. Here's what he said. When they asked, Jesus asked, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And I'm asking you that question today. Who do you say that Jesus is? Are you going to say like Peter said? I say that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Grammar, they got the grammar right, didn't they? I say that. Do you say that? If you don't say that, would you walk down this aisle or get saved or ask Jesus to come in your heart right where you're at? You can get saved right where you're at. But you need to come and confess it, make it public. And God will give you grace to do that. Would you do that? Stand with me for prayer. Come on, Kenny, get us a hymn of invitation. Now, don't worry about we ain't give God enough time anyway. I had to get that sermon out. I couldn't take that home with me. God said, just preach it, son, preach it. And I'm glad that I did, and I'm glad that he blessed my heart. If you're here today, we're glad you're here. If you are saved, that's wonderful. If you're not, you need to be, and you can be. Wouldn't it be wonderful to get saved on Christmas Eve? It would be wonderful. Father, we love you. We love you, Jesus. Love you, Holy Spirit. And I tell you that every day. And I mean it every day. I really, really do. And I thank you this morning for the Spirit of Holy Spirit that I felt in my heart. I really, really have felt your presence. And I know these people, God, have worshipped. We've worshipped you this day. And, Lord, we didn't give you much time today. You deserve more time than we give you anyway. Some people, God, you know, they, they get so tied up on their time. And they're too busy, God we got too many Christians in the closet. We need to get some of these Christians out of the closet, God. They need to get out of the closet back where they used to be and be biblical Christians, God, and be proud that you're a child of God and be dedicated and committed to you, God. We need those Christians out of the closet. Now, I don't feel like I'm in the closet. I really don't. Father, I'm out of the closet. Thank you, Lord, for being a Christian. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for coming to my heart. Now, I'm going to turn the service over to you, God. Now, I don't know whether anybody's listening to this message or not. I don't know whether anybody's going to accept, accept the truth or not. I don't know. That's up to you and them. But, Lord, do a work on them right now. Holy Spirit, invite them into the kingdom. Invite them in right now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Kenny.